Ramey Martin Galiatovich. I am the program director of the Project on Positive Leadership. So glad to see all of you here today. Um, some of you came to our last showcase, which was in February. So glad to see you back. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what we do, and then I'm going to introduce our speaker. And we have another speaker that was supposed to be with us today, and she is not well. So. Um, because of technology, I think we're going to be able to bring her in through Teams. Fingers crossed. I've never done that before. Um, and so she will join us around 9.30. So um, the Project on Positive Leadership, if you don't already know, um, our mission is to increase positive leadership throughout the world. Um, we primarily do this through creating and distributing instructional tools or learning tools, as we call them. Um, we deliver these tools in partnerships with others, and we support research on positive leadership. So today you're going to get to see a few of our tools, um, and hear a little bit more about our website that has the tools on it. So again, um, we do have a website, and um, full disclosure, I um, printed out the slides last week, so there's been a little change, so they might not be quite in order as the, the very few, few parts. So. Um, so we do have a pretty robust website with many, many tools. Um, this includes case studies, learning activities, um, we have a virtue advice series, and technical notes. Um, and we also have our flagship um, tool, which is a smartphone application called the Leadership Amplifier. So I um, also wanted to say that our website is currently under construction. You can still go there and see the tools, but you may see some weird things up until about next week. But if you go to our website, right at the top, it says instructional tools. You click on there and you'll find the whole suite. And they're all free of charge except for the smartphone application. So we also, in addition to distributing these tools, we have several other initiatives, many of which we've launched this year. Um, so it's been a kind of an exciting year, exciting past 10 months. But, um, one of the things that we do is we collaborate with executive education. We have our director of um, executive education over here, Virginia, Denny. And so we offer um, a positive leadership certificate course, and as well as other offerings um, like project management, and then she also does custom with companies. Um, so if you have questions about executive education, Virginia's here to talk to you about it. And um, we do a Tyree Family Distinguished Conversation Series. Um, so four times a year, we bring in um, scholars of, uh, who specialize in leadership. We also bring in um, distinguished business people to um, do not only talks, but they meet with faculty, they meet with students, they, meet, they go in classrooms, they meet with staff. And we had our first two this, this winter. We, held, we had um, Bob Lighton from University of Illinois, Chicago. And we had Sue Ashford from the University of Michigan. I'm excited to say that this September we are having a really special guest. Um, we are in conjunction with the Center for Free Enterprise. We're bringing in Howard Behar, who's the former CEO of Starbucks. So he will be with us on September 27th, and more information will be coming out about that on our website. We also do rector fellowships. So thanks to the um, to the um, Sam and Bonnie Rector Family Trust. We've provided fellowships for three years um, to, um, re to conduct research or develop tools for teaching positive leadership. We're in our third cohort. We do five people a year, and we will be releasing our RFP for the next cohort in September. Yeah, and so all of their work is published on our website as well, and you are welcome to access that. We currently are in the third one, and they are probably going to be turning in their reports or their research or tools this fall. So. Um, we honor specific acts of positive leadership. So um, we, you will see on your card, it looks like this. Yeah. And there's a QR code on the back. So um, we are asking people if they see um, leaders in action or demonstrate, or people demonstrating acts of positive leadership that you go on our website and nominate them. And what we're gonna do, hopefully, is at the end of the year, we have awards in the business school, we're gonna honor them that way. 
We're going to bring them in, hopefully, as speakers. It's just a way for us to um, continually collaborate with those out in the community and across the campus. We also have something called virtue experts. Today, Vivian Blade was our original virtue expert. These are people that we are um, that we are um, collaborating with around positive leadership. They are providing us with more tools than we could possibly create on our own. Um, they, they come in as speakers with us. And so we right now have approximately five to six people who are virtue experts. Denise, <laughs> one of them. I'm, I'm actually working, trying to get some other people involved with us. But, um, and as I said, Vivian's our original one, and she's an expert in the um, virtue of resiliency. Um, locally within U of L, we're doing some initiatives. We're um, working with a group of administrators and professors across campus, looking at the intersection between positive leadership and diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're early in the stages of this, so we're not sure where that's going to head, but we're looking at doing research within this group, um, also maybe possibly trainings on campus or um, possibly doing some publishing. And then last, we have started collaborating with the undergraduate department um, and the College of Business on some retention efforts, and so we have to be working with them in the near future, maybe doing a seminar, seminar with your undergraduate students or possibly having them use our smartphone application. So, thank you. Yes. The diversity, equity, and inclusion group? Yeah, so we're just currently meeting. If you're interested in meeting with us, I can give you that information. We don't have anything yet that we've published or anything concrete. The first few meetings, I think we've had four, have just been sort of discovery, like how we can collaborate around that issue. So, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Okay, curious. Yeah, this is for administrators. Administrators and some of people are staff and some are professors. Yeah, but we do have quite a few administrators. So next up, I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker, Ryan Quinn, our first speaker, I should say. And Vivian was supposed to be our first speaker, so we're going to let Ryan go first um, because we're not sure about how this is going to work with the technology. But um, Dr. Ryan Quinn, who's in the back of the room, is the academic director, and he's got a lot of titles, so bear with me. <laughs> I was listing them out last night. Um, he is the academic director of the project. Um, he is also um, assistant dean of innovation and strategy, associate professor, and chair for management and entrepreneurship. Did I get that correct? Okay. I believe you just entered your ninth year with the College of Business. Just finishing the ninth year. Just finishing the ninth year, so almost a decade here with us at U of L. Um, his areas of teaching and research include leadership organizational behavior and negotiations and change management. Um, his research focuses on such topics as psychological states, courage, learning from success, and high impact conversations. Outside of the university, Ryan has consulted for Fortune 500 companies, private firms, and startup businesses, and currently he's working with our athletic department at the university. Um, he has a BS in statistics from Brigham Young and a PhD and management and organizations from the Ross School of Business. And I messed up my paper, sorry. Sorry, guys. I got it, thank you. He's also studied um, international business and corporate strategy at, at a university in Japan. I'm not even gonna attempt to pronounce it, okay. but. Um, He's been heavily involved in the positive organizational scholarship movement, focusing his research questions on understanding what makes organizations and people within them flourish, excel, and exceed expectations. He co-authored two editions of the book, Lift, with his father, Robert Quinn. Um, Ryan lives in Creswood, Kentucky, with his wife and four children. And I'm going to let you come up here and talk about what the concept of positive leadership is, and then go into the virtue of ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Rainey. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, Rainey was talking about the, our virtue experts that we're gathering and, and uh, various professors or consultants or coaches, you know, and, and so one of the things we do is we focus on individual virtues and then sometimes we also focus on the overall concept of leadership. And so 
One way, we're going to, today, as she mentioned, we're going to focus on ambition, and then when we bring Vivian in, we're going to talk about resilience as, as two of uh, the virtues that we'll be talking about. But just to make sure that we put it in context and understand why and how we're going to be talking about these things, I wanted to give you a brief introduction to the idea of positive leadership. And often when it comes to you know, getting an idea, a good way to do that is with contrast. So a common thing that we hear is, you know, what's the difference between management and leadership? And um, a lot of times people talk about management in a derogatory term compared to leadership. That's not our stance here. Even though we are focusing on leadership, we think management is actually pretty important and we wouldn't get most of what we get done in modern organizations today without management because management is how you coordinate things. And in a complex world, you have to coordinate to get things done. But one of the things that uh, putting these up here enables us to do is for, it enables us to show how management and leadership are episodic, meaning that I could lead in this moment, manage in the next moment, fail to manage or lead in the next moment, and if I'm not leading, you might do it or you might do it, and this can flow between people. And we have uh, various exercises that we've done to, to show you know, that this is not something that inheres in individuals per se, but inheres in our actions and what we do. So we basically define management as a process that begins when a person requests something or gives you instruction, and then we follow it because of the authority that the person has to make that request or to give that instruction. And that's not bad. Most of us don't enjoy being told what to do, but we don't even think about it a whole lot if we accept a person's authority. The more you accept it, the less you think about it. You just do what you're asked to do. And we get things done that way. On the other hand, if a person actually exceeds their authority, asks for things that are, we see as inappropriate or whatever else, we realize what the limits of authority are and people don't follow. Leadership, in contrast, could happen at the same time as management, right? So if I'm a manager and I ask you to do something and it's appropriate within my authority, you might follow that. I could also do it in an exceptional way. So it may be that the common way of doing things around here is to say, hey, will you get this done for me? And people follow because it's a manager and that's what we do. But I may choose to be exceptionally kind or thoughtful as I, and therefore exhibit a virtue of kindness or thoughtfulness when I do it. And I may say, hey, how are you feeling about this? Can we work on this today? What does it mean? And I change the way I do it. And when I do that, I may be managing because I'm asking somebody to do something. But I'm also leading because I'm exceeding our normal way of doing things in terms of one or more virtues. So when we exhibit a virtue, now we don't have to request. Leadership can happen without that. So I may just do something courageous. I'm not your boss. I have no authority over you or anything else. But you see that. You feel inspired by it. And you choose to follow, not because of authority, but just because you're inspired by that example and, and what it means to you. So leadership happens when a person exhibits at least one virtue with more excellence than people normally do. That being said, if we look at virtue ethics as a philosophy or a theory from, uh, from the field of philosophy, it's possible to exhibit one virtue and not exhibit other virtues. And therefore, when I exhibit that one virtue, I'm still not entirely ethical. Uh, one current event that I use for talking about this recently is the invasion of Ukraine. If you look at the um, polls that have been done in Russia, some of them are probably compelled because it is a totalitarian regime. But <laughs> some people apparently really do support what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine. They may support it because they see courage in standing up to foreign powers or uh, trying to restore the glory of Mother Russia or you know, whatever it may be. And therefore, they feel inspired by that. And it might be, at least for some people, leadership. However, there's clearly not compassion. There's clearly not uh, honesty or humility or many other virtues that a person could exhibit. And in fact, even though it may be leadership, it's not positive leadership because it's devastating and it's not only its consequences, but in the virtues that it shows. And so we are at the Project on Positive Leadership trying to increase positive leadership in the world. That begins with leadership, where we exhibit one virtue with more excellence. But eventually, we want to work and, and help people exhibit on a regular basis 
all of the virtues that are relevant to a given situation. So one thing you also won't see us do in the project on positive leadership is say these are the four correct virtues that you should always do or the seven or you know whatever it is because in any given situation different virtues may be more relevant. So today we might be talking about ambition and resilience and those are things that are res uh, uh, relevant when you go back to work but tomorrow at work when you encounter another situation compassion and honesty might be more relevant and so it changes from situation to situation. So we're not going to be prescriptive. We're going to, what we will prescribe is, is ongoing learning over time. So that's the philosophy under which we're going to be doing this today. The other thing that I want to do as we dive into talking about ambition as, as our first virtue this morning is to remind, I'm going to deliver this a lot like I would in an executive classroom or an MBA classroom or, or an undergraduate classroom or you know, whatever it may be. However, our purpose here is not, uh, you didn't come here to have me teach you things. <laughs> the, this is a showcase and we're showing off some of our tools so that people can see what tools are useful to them and, and how it might be and we'll periodically uh, showcase various tools that we have. That being said, I want to invite you into the conversation. What, not only do we want to know what works for you or doesn't work for you about a tool that we're offering on a given day, but also how can we partner with you? What kind of tools would you like to see? What kind of uh, virtues do you want to see more of? What tools might we create that uh, works for your organization or your classroom or whatever it is and, and engages us, us in that conversation because everyone here is uh, either a teacher on your own right or a manager which essentially is also a teacher uh, wherever you may be. So with that in mind, I'm going to dive into this today, but I also, as I talk and as Vivian talks later, I want you to uh, also have a conversation with us about how we can partner, what we can do together to build these tools and increase positive leadership in the world. All right, with that in mind, one of the tools that we offer at the Project on Positive Leadership with regards to ambition is a tool for problem solving versus purpose finding. And with regards to this tool, there are many ways to approach this. Uh, as with any virtue, ambition uh, is something that, uh, as Aristotle said, is something that is ideal when it's at the perfect level for that situation at this time in this way. And that means you can have too much ambition and you can have too little ambition. And Again, it's situation specific. So the idea is that leadership requires me to be aware and to adapt in real time. This is a tool for helping us think about it. And um, the primary place where this comes from is Robert Fritz. Uh, he wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled, and I highly recommend it. Um, and we're going to talk about what it means. And it turns out that this way of thinking is less common than we think it is. And so with this tool, what we do is introduce a number of little mini cases that we'll discuss. And the reason why we do many cases instead of one big case is because there's a, a practice of mind that requires practice, that requires us to try it over and over again and get used to thinking this way so that we can do it more repeatedly. So with that in mind, here's the first vignette. Please take a moment and uh, read this story. Okay, now a couple people in this room have seen this before, so you know, let the other struggle with it if you have seen it before. Um, but what I'd like you to do is tell me, uh, this is what I want you thinking about, if you're Kurt Wright, what do you do? Now, to make sure we really understand this story, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, why not just shave off a day? So right now, it, we're 38 months into the project, we're 18 months behind. If you're 18 or more months behind at the 48 month mark, then you lose $30 million out of this contract. That's bad. <laughs> the question is, 
if we just shave off one day so we're only 17 months and 29 days behind, then we're good, right? Why won't that work? Sorry, I didn't see. Because you have ah. to have results at a certain time. No? Yeah, but if we shave off a day, won't that you know, mean that we get the results? We don't lose $30 million, everything's good, right? <laughs> yeah, Peter. Um, it's the wrong goal to have plus that one day is too, too small of an incremental change. Why is it too small? Because you can lose it too quickly. Ah. <laughs> OK, so there are those kinds of dangers. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, good. Yes. We're also not understanding what led up to this, right? Like ah. Uh, or 17 months and 29 days of why things have gotten come up. Absolutely. So for example, at the beginning, we were at zero months, we were zero months behind. Now at 38 months, we're 18 months behind. And although the trend was probably not as linear as this graph depicts, there's some kind of downward trend. So at 48 months, we're not going to be 18 months behind. We're going to be like 23 months behind. And shaving off a day isn't going to work, right? This is a systemic problem that Kurt Wright faces when he comes to this situation. So with that in mind, you're Kurt Wright. What do you do? Okay. Which me, to me says that there is a disconnect in the project management. There's definitely uh, there's not enough checking in with the different parts of the overall project to say this is where we are, or even they're probably working on some non-essential things to the to the ultimate product. So I think if I'm in there, I'm trying to figure out okay, what is the actual product you're trying to get to? What are things that you can that you can cut out that aren't going to ultimately allow you to deliver a product as quickly as possible? And then what are the next steps? OK, good. I like how methodical you are there, right? So start with the goal, get down to the problems, and then what are the things we can do to address those? All right? Well, I'm going to take you back off of Meg for a second, though. You don't, without knowledge, it, it could have been a supply chain issue that now it, they had anticipated it. Um, it was a little worse. I mean, you really do need to understand, because maybe the supply chain got fixed, and all of a sudden, whatever it was that was missing is now there, and a little acceleration. So without really understanding the why behind, I don't know if you can jump to conclusions on anything. Yeah. Is there an internal problem? Is there an I external I problem? I the why is so important. OK, good. So we need to get down to the why. OK, there's two hands here. I guess we'll start with Luckett and then come back to Peter. Um, so I'm looking at stress, the word stress in this bar graph, and thinking, what is it that is going on with the engineers and the managers that has led to this, that's some of the internal stuff that might be, the, that might be involved, and also how you alleviate that so that they can take the steps that they need to take to do whatever is needed. Interesting. Why do you think they're stressed? Um, well, it may be the pressure from above. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be, well, they want to do a good job. They want to make their money. They don't want to lose $30 million. All the kinds of things that would make them feel that they were failing yep. are what causes the stress out of them. Yeah. Let's play with that for a minute. If they lose the $30 million, what happens to them? They may be gone. Yeah, right. There's some, the, if the company can't support this, this is a major chunk of cash for this company, right? So that would stress me out for sure. Peter? Okay. Fair point.
<laughs> okay. All right. I like that. So we go from this idea of, you know, like what's the problems, what's the why, and then what are we going to do about it to really specific categories that we can start looking for to break it down and analyze it in more detail. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Michelle. Um, I was just going to add that could they spend a little time asking the engineers who are actually doing the work, what are they facing? Maybe there's obstacles that could be removed. Maybe there's communications that aren't happening. Um, expectations aren't clear, a whole bunch of things, but often the people doing the work know more than the people at the top managing the work, and Absolutely. if we don't listen to them, then we keep going in a, a spiral. Which gives us a nice additional way to go about doing the analysis. Okay, was that the same comment? Or? Totally same comment. <laughs> and then when, you know, when you're thinking about the traditional term of ambition, company took on this pro $100 million project, but likely did not have conversations with the people that would be doing the work, to see if it was actually feasible, or to help them understand their purpose in that work, mm -hmm. right? And understanding those, their roles and what they are supposed to be doing and how that contributes to the overall project yep. um, and goals. Absolutely. Uh, same theme at the table. There's a clue for me in that the engineers have yeah. fallen behind, mm -hmm. but the stress, then the managers jump back in there, but mm -hmm. somehow the engineers are being blamed yeah. for, for the being behind. And so the managers are blaming the engineers, and who are the engineers blaming? The yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, good. Any other observations of what you could do if you're Kurt Wright? Okay. Okay. You know, I don't know. It seems to me that he could look at himself and or herself, whoever it was, and kind of identify. Well, this happened on my watch. So, just to clarify, Kurt is a consultant who was just hired in for this. Okay. But your point nevertheless applies to everybody else, right? Is like, how about I look within and say, hey, what am I doing about this? Okay. Good. Good. All right, I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> this is a story that uh, I actually discovered. Uh, you can find it in, in my book, Lift, that Ramey mentioned at the beginning. That it's actually like from a 1930s uh, Reader's Digest. And um, the reason I want, as I tell you this story, I'd like you to think, what does this story have to do with Kurt Wright's situation? Does that make sense? Okay. So the story was about a guy named Richard Thurman who grew up in some, I don't know, idyllic uh, Americana town in the you know, early 1900s. And he said, you know, one day this woman moved into our town into the, you know, this big mansion and, and uh, she was clearly rich and so everybody called her the countess in town. And I was out you know, running around with my friends one day and I ran under one of her you know, hedges and, and into her yard and suddenly I discovered I had been grabbed by my uh, ear and she said, What's your name? And I said, my name's Richard. And, and she said, um, I have watched you mow your lawn, and you're going to mow my lawn, too. <laughs> and he said, OK. And so she said, so I want you to show up tomorrow uh, to mow my lawn. And he says, so I showed up the next day, and she laid it out for me. She said, all right. Uh, well, actually, she didn't lay it out. First, she just had him mow the lawn. And so he, he mowed the lawn, and she pointed out, you know, like, you need to do this instead. You need to do that instead. And eventually, he you know, got the lawn mowed and, and uh, finished. And she said, OK, this is a decent job that you did, did, just did today with me helping and pushing you the whole time. If you do this again, then I'll pay you $3 for what you've done. On the other hand, if you can do a really amazing job with this without me having to push and guide you all the time, I'll pay you $4 for mowing my lawn. And for $5, oh, forget about $5. $5 is impossible. 
you know, just show up and, and I want you to try to, you know, do a $4 lawn. And he said, okay. And so he says, I showed up the next week to mow her lawn. And when I showed up, I pushed myself really hard and tried to get it done. And I knocked on the door at the end of the day and she said, all right, how much did you earn today? And he said, 250. <laughs> and she's like, okay. He pays him the 250, comes back, does it again the next week, another 250. She's like, if you can't do better two, than 250, you might not be mowing my lawn for long. And he's like, okay. And every day, week, he says, I went back, I eventually got it up to $3. But you know, each week I had this goal of trying to mow a $4 lawn and I couldn't do it. And I would just resign to my bed and defeat each week because, you know, why can I not do this? And, and struggling with it. And he says, and then one day, as I lay in my bed and defeat at the end of the day after mowing another $3 lawn when I was shooting for $4, suddenly an idea occurred to me. And the idea is, wait a minute, I shouldn't be trying to mow a $4 lawn. I should be trying to mow a $5 lawn, the lawn that she said was impossible. He said, now what's interesting is when that thought popped in my head, two things happened to me. The first thing that happened to me is I sat up in bed in excitement, like, whoa, that would be so cool if I mowed a $5 lawn. He said, but then the second thing that happened is a bunch of ideas popped into my head. They were um, knowledge that I already had, but wasn't relevant until I had the idea of mowing a $5 lawn. For example, I knew from walking around that lawn in my bare feet that there were worm mounds, and a $5 lawn wouldn't have worm mounds. So I would need to take a rolling pin out in that lawn and roll out the worm mounds. And I know that there was uh, grass coming up between the flagstones, and a $5 lawn would need me to go in and pull the grass out from between the flagstones. And I need to bring a ruler and edge the lawn to make sure that it looks good. And all of those things are necessary for a $5 lawn. And so I was like, Whew. so the next week I showed up and I was all geared to do it and I started working and you know, my resolve was gone like within an hour <laughs> of trying to do this. But I came up with one more idea and that is I would take 10 minute breaks. I'd sit down under a tree, I'd relax for a little bit and then I'd go out and do it again and pretty soon I had mowed it both ways. It was checkered and I had done everything and by the time I was done, it was like night and you could, you know, uh, the dawn, or not dawn, the uh, Sunset, thank you, was coming and it was starting to get dark and I knocked on the door and the countess answered the door and she said, all right, how much is it this week? And I said, five dollars. She paused. She said, I told you five dollars was impossible. And he goes, I know. She goes, okay, I got to come out and see the world's first five dollar lawn. So she walks out and saw like all the grass gone between the, head, the stones and you know, the worm mounds you know, rolled out and everything else and was blown away. And she says, what on earth inspired you to do this? And I couldn't answer her, he says. I, I didn't know. And she goes, oh, I think I know. And I was surprised. And I said, what? And she says, when this happened, did you feel both a thrill, but also just a little touch of fear? And she's like, yeah. Or he says, I, yeah, that's exactly you know, how I felt. And she goes, every once in a while, God or the universe calls you to do something great. And you can run away and hide from it, or you can rise up to it and do the impossible. And he, includes this, he concludes this, this story in the Reader's Digest by saying, ever since then, when I have heard the word impossible, I have treated it as being called to do something great. Okay, what does that story have to do with Kurt Wright's problem? Yeah. So, uh, I got a couple of different ways to think about this. Um, the first thing is that with a project that is so long, so involved, it's easy to lose that steam. Mm -hmm. Very easy to lose sight of why you're doing this. It just becomes a task, especially when you hit walls. Mm -hmm. When you hit walls, it's like you start to feel that those sort of negative feelings. Am I going to be able to do this? I can't do this. No, no, there's no way. The story, the piece of the story that I think that was kind of, uh, I would say, an underrated portion of it is those 10 minute breaks. <laughs> those 10 minute breaks not only allows him, him to take a break, but also to check his progress, to check in with himself, to, that was his way of saying, this is where I am in the project. Let me evaluate. So when I mentioned earlier, the scrum, scrum moves in sprints. 
Mm-hmm. They also utilize daily stand-ups to check in with every aspect of the project so that you're actually creating a product semi-basically daily. And then by the end of the week, you're saying, okay, I'm at, right now, I'm at a $2 ROI. Mm-hmm. Well, I know I need to, based off of what my team is saying, we need to do these things. So by the next week, you're at a $3 ROI because you pull, you use the role thing. Yeah. So when you establish in Kirk's situation, if Kirk walks in and establishes that culture of feedback and progress tracking that may or may not have been prevalent once he does some fact finding, then he's setting them up for the opportunity to know where they are and be able to see themselves getting to that $5 line or getting to that project or saying, this is not, this is not the project for us. Awesome. Thank you. Other thoughts? Does this maybe also have something to do with internal motivation? Say more. Does this also perhaps have something to do with internal motivation, intrinsic motivation? Mm -hmm. No, so I'm wondering, tell us why you think that. Um, It was his aha moment that turned things around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some people like that challenge of the impossible. Yeah. Um, but that was coming from within, not coming from without. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a piece of it for sure. He, did, he, he took some time to rest. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it was interesting that you mentioned that in the story. You could just. Yeah. Well, and when you're pursuing the impossible, like uh, taking care of your capability can be a very important thing. Sure. I liked how he took the time through his aha moment to paint a picture of what it could look like. So he had a different kind of investment than maybe these engineers have if they're being told what to do. And they, again, going back to that idea of getting them involved in the solutioning, mm-hmm. um, they might end up coming up with, you know, exceeding the, the original contract, you know, if, if they have that kind of motivation. Yeah, absolutely, right? I think in the story, we see the young man become just like open to the possibility of um, of what he can accomplish if he starts to think outside of this box. So um, externally open, right, of all of the different tools and resources that he can bring to the work that he wouldn't even have considered when he was facing this, imp- when he was you know, facing an impossible goal. Mm-hmm. But when he reset and reevaluated, um, he allowed himself to bring, right, different methodology to the work, which it didn't want to leave. Absolutely, yeah. That's the kind of thing with chances, like having that little bit of fear kind of drives you to do something you may have not thought of before, like using the rolling pin and doing things like of that sort. Absolutely. Let me ask this question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I have one more thought. Yeah. I think the way I would look at it too is he stopped worrying about the past and he said success is farther. So if you could think about Kurt going forward and saying, we don't just need to make up this amount of time. We're, you know, we could accelerate and like someone earlier said, achieve it. So sort of set the success frame, reframe it. Okay, let's dig into that one for just a minute here. I'm going to make this really explicit. In Kurt's challenge, what is a $4 lawn and what is a $5 lawn? $4 would probably be just, you know, maybe getting the 18 months back. Don't lose $30 million right. at the 18, at the $5 40 month. would be, we can beat it. We can, you know, we can achieve our goal even earlier. It's not a 16 month project, it's a, I don't know, 55 month project. Nope. Oh, here we go. I, I don't think no, that's, so let me show you what actually happened. Yeah, you know, people. 
So, everybody loves a good Disney ending, <laughs> but this one I think requires us to dig a little bit deeper. First thing I want us to dig deep in is this word right here. His question angered people. Why? He's walking around asking questions. What's so angering about that? Okay, how is he challenging authority by asking this question? Because he's asking people to report to people. So he's right. Yep, okay, good. Yeah? Well, he was challenging the word impossible. He was challenging the word impossible, okay. At that point, a lot of them have probably just given up and said, no, there's, there's no way. This $30 million, I mean, I'm going to rock it on my, on my neck. And I don't, I don't know about that. I, we're not going to get it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. But tell me, I want to dig into the first part of what you said there. You said he was challenging the word impossible and that makes them angry for some reason. Wouldn't that make them happy? Well, when, I feel like when you are backed into a list, let's just say, um, when you're like in a position where you're like, there's no way I can put, you're just looking in front of you and this wall that you're climbing is just like huge and crazy. You're like, there's no way I can do this. It's like, well, what if you what do you mean what if I could? Like, I can't do this. I can't even get to the shaving it down to 18 months, and you're trying to get me to do that? Like, seriously? Okay, good. There's another hand over here somewhere. I was just going to say, I think what might make people angry is the question would, um, there's almost like an assumption that you weren't already doing right your best to try to hit the goal. You could but easily take it as an implicit question. accusation, yeah. right? Like, yeah. don't you think we're already doing everything exactly. we can? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Scares? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> it, scares <laughs> it scares them. Why? What's scary about it? Because they think they don't have the capacity to reach that goal. Yeah. And like, I'm already <laughs> coming to work early, leaving work late. Yeah. Okay. Peter? He uh, surrendered the outcome, which means yep. he gave up you know, what the assumption was going to be that they were going to fail. Right. And he also challenged people to uh, promote their perspectives. Ah, right. So it's not, he, he actually, and this is something some of you mentioned, right, is he is asking for input from the people involved in doing it. Although it's interesting in asking their input that they're getting angry that their input is being asked at the same time. Virginia? But if he had asked, Whined about all the problems with these stupid managers or these lazy employees or you know whatever else and would have dumped right on him all the most unhelpful information he could have possibly wanted in the world. But his question was solution focused, right? How do we get to a solution? And just to piggyback on that concept of fear, I think if you hear somebody asking that question as a member of the team, you might be afraid that somebody else is going to come up with the answer, mm -hmm. so that will incite some, <laughs> some competition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Peter. I also like how he's not uh, um, creating any blame, right? He's not mm -hmm. saying yeah. what went wrong. He's saying, what can we do from here? Right. If they get upset about the blame, it's because they're attributing it to his question. He's not attributing the blame explicitly in any way. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, he's also asking like in the home, and like it's probably a little bit more of like a personal setting. So instead of like being in like a whole meeting and kind of just questioning it, it kind of like gives them a chance to actually look at them for themselves instead of like doing nothing or always blaming the manager and vice versa. So it's kind of like very just kind of similar. Yeah, so he's promoting reflection. Let's use that as a segue, right? So these people are livid. 
<laughs> they're angry at him. They're all upset. You know, we're already stressed out anyways, as we pointed out earlier. So now you've just upped the stress to, you know, 11. And somehow they get from anger and upset to $45 million. How do you get from the anger and upset to here? Okay, so learning, building relationships. And then based on that, he was sharing, and everybody could feel that they were involved, and they were part of that. Mm -hmm. He was also tapping into our psyche about, I'm going to do it. Like there's an internal, like that whole ambition thing you yep. were talking about. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you get, I mean, first I'm pissed. <laughs> then you move past it and go, I got to do it now. Like the $5 thing, yep. you skip for. I, I can do it. The tapping into people's internal desire to succeed. Yeah, good. Yeah, Holly. I was just going to say that in, that, in doing that, you created buy in amongst the group. Yeah, because it's the coming from them. You probably identified new leaders. Ah. Uh. I think that's a fair hypothesis. In fact, I like to envision it like this, right? Like I'm one of these engineers, I'm walking down the hallway, you know, Kurt comes up to me, asks me this question, I'm like, are you serious? Like, dude. You're the consultant. We hired you. Why don't you tell us? Right? And, you know, kind of just get all upset. And I'm just the rest of the day, I see my friends at work. I'm like, can you believe this guy management hired? Right? And, <laughs> and then, like, I go home and my wife is like, how was your day today? I'm like, let me tell you about it. Right? And dump on her, too. And then I get a good night's sleep. That gives you a chance for the brain to unwind and do some different things. And I wake up and I'm in the shower, because that's where all my epiphanies happen, is in the shower, right? And I'm standing there, and suddenly I'm like, wait a minute. What if we did get this done a week early? Right? Tap into that intrinsic motivation. And I'm like, that would be so cool. Now remember what happened to Richard Thurman when he said, what if I mowed a $5 lawn? Two things. One, he sat up in bed excited. Right? Positive emotions change the way we think. Number two is he remembered things that he already knew but weren't relevant until the goal changed. Once the goal changed, he saw worm mounds, he saw edging, he saw picking up the grass in between the stones. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, what if we did finish this? Well, that would mean that even though I hate Michelle's guts because of the way she treated me last year, we're not going to get this done unless I collaborate with her, so maybe I can approach her about this. And even though this means I'm going to have to share some of my budget with you know, people over here, that might be worth it if we get it done. And I start taking these ideas of things I already know, but I'm not acting on, and I start acting on them. And then not only do I act on them, because leaders are now emerging, not only do I act on them, but Denise sees me like actually collaborating with Michelle, and she's like, huh. Well, if he can do that, then maybe I can, da 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 da. And pretty soon, all of the solutions which are already in the system emerge. And people act on them and are able to build it out until we accomplish something incredible together. Now, <clears throat> what I want us to pull out of this case that we just walked through is the difference between purpose versus problem. And if I can be so bold as to say this, when I asked you what Kurt Wright should do, almost every answer that you guys gave me was analysis, problem solving, right? There's a problem. We accept the problem as defined and given to us, and therefore we analyze to come up with solutions. That doesn't make you bad people. That makes you like every other human being on Earth, right? That's what we all do. It's our instinctive reaction. If I have a problem, I solve it. That's what you do when you have a problem. And in fact, if you've been to school and undergrad or graduate school and you go in and what do we train you to do? We train you to do analysis. So like not only is that our instinctive reaction, but that's what we train everybody to do for years and years and years. And so of course, we're good problem solvers. And the ability to stop when I encounter a problem and ask a different question to move me out of problem and into purpose is a skill that changes everything. Analysis isn't bad, but we get different results to our analysis depending on whether we're mowing a $4 lawn or a $5 lawn. So 
if I want to move from problems to purpose, uh, Richard or uh, Robert Fritz says we need to stop. He says a lot of people say, "Oh, I am purpose-centered because I am a, I am goal-oriented and I set goals." And he's like, "No. First of all, a goal is not a purpose. A goal, a purpose is a goal, but a goal is not a purpose, right? And second of all, um, most of us think that we're moving to purpose when we're actually solving problems because our problems are goal-oriented. Usually." our problems come to us in one of two ways. Either something goes wrong and we try to fix it and get back to the status quo and we never ask, is there something better than the status quo? Or somebody gives us a problem. The boss comes and says, hey, will you take care of this for me? And the problem is defined and we don't say, wait, can I do something better than what the boss is asking me to do? Or my spouse or my child or you know, whoever else comes up and gives me a problem and we just accept the definition it's given. Fritz says, Instead of the instinctive question of how do I get what I want, we should be asking the question, what result do I want to create? And that's how you change a problem into a purpose. So one way to check yourself and say, am I being problem driven or am I being purpose driven, is to compare a few things. First of all is my level of ambition and creativity. Purposes are more ambitious than problems. And so I question impossibility, seek to create a new reality, maybe make it a stretch goal versus seeking to meet expectations or to recreate the status quo and get things back to where I was comfortable before. <clears throat> it's not means end thinking, so, or it's means versus end thinking. The, the purpose asks what before we ask the how. The how is where the analysis happens. Uh, the problem asks how and not what. We accept the goal is given. The framing. With purpose, we're approaching a challenge. Sometimes with problems, we approach a challenge because we like problems, we like to solve them. But a lot of times, we're trying to mitigate a threat when it comes to a problem. We have much broader scope or time frame. In this case, he's thinking, wait a minute, let's not think about 48 months and losing $30 million. Let's think about 60 months and, and the whole project. So we think broader. Or let's not think about the $4 loan. Let's think about a $5 loan and what would that entail? It can be different, right? So in this case, Kurt Wright could have said, if let's say the 60 month mark wasn't realistic or not, uh, just didn't work out or actually ended up being impossible, because sometimes things are impossible, uh, even if we try it, although we should test that hypothesis and not take it for granted that something's impossible. Um, but he could have said, all right, so let's say it's not about uh, 60 months. Uh, let's say instead, what could we do? Even if we lose $30 million, what could we learn in this project to create a new organizational capability that helps us to assess projects, get them done faster, and always be successful on them in the future. Well, boom, now I've thought outside the scope of the project into what else am I accomplishing here, and I, that might also be a purpose. And then finally, the driver for a purpose is interest and enthusiasm, where the driver for a problem is to reduce my tension. So all of these can serve as checkpoints for me to think, am I trying to solve problems or am I pursuing purpose in my work? All right, so let's try to apply it on one other case here. Take a look at this one and uh, tell me what, okay. I got to watch my time here. All right, so you're Rob Roberto Goizeta this time. What do you do? Well, you could play it safe. You, have, you lost the gamble, so one option would be, well, we're just going to play it safe and try to get a tiny percent, or you set some ambitious share goal and get others to help you think through what could we do. I mean, I'm just kind of idea. Mm -hmm. um, you either retrench or you go big. Yep. Okay, good. So 
if we're fighting over tenths of a percent of market share, what can we do to beat Pepsi to win, like, go from, if I don't know what it is, if it's, let's say we both have 40% market share right now, then let's see, what if we could do to get up to 60 instead of fighting over tenths of a percent? Might be one way to approach that, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Say more. Well, you develop Diet Coke, which is a new product to the market to take out the sugar that everybody is concerned about. Okay. Good. I'm going to play with that in just a minute. Other ideas? I, I noticed that they change their advertisement to get it more emotional and be connected <laughs> with family, things like that. All right. I love that observation, but I want to point something out about it. What question were you asking to drive you to that answer? Say it again, please. <laughs> <laughs> Was that, if I'm focusing on my advertising, am I focusing on the what or the how? Mm. Ah, okay, so I point that out because this is what I mean and why we practice this, right? There's habits of mind that you have to try new habits and practice them to get to it, yeah. Okay. What, are we, what are we doing? What are we doing well in the case of new Coke versus old Coke? Well, we were clearly doing old, old Coke well. Okay. So that's going to lead you to, you know, problems that you can solve. Yep. You know, um, or what is, if we're fighting over this, this uh, one tenth of a percent, what is Pepsi doing well? Uh huh. Then that might give us ideas of what purposes could be. Okay. Yeah, yep, absolutely. All right, so let me show you what Goizetta did. So it wasn't just colas, they moved into sodas, monster drinks, fruit drinks, bottled water, everything else, and there's the result. So what result do we want to create? We don't want to just create, you know, that we get a little bit more market share of cola away from Pepsi. We wanted that the share of stomach in this situation, yeah. Uh huh. Strategy and how instead of trying to fight for that, the blue ocean, like sharks fighting for that same piece of food in the, in the, you know, the ecosystem, instead of hatching ants, no, there's this other place. There's plenty more ocean that we could swim into. So, yeah, like walking into the situation instead of saying, we're tired of food, what are, what are other possibilities that, that exist? Yeah, absolutely. Us? Yeah, right. So, in the marketing world, this is what purpose finding often looks like, some version of blue ocean strategy. In the accounting world, it might be zero-based budgeting. Uh, and there are other forms it might take if we're talking about the business world. But let's even move beyond that. In the personal world, what does it look like? Here's a, a quick story from my dad. Um, he was once sitting in his office, minding his own business, and one of his colleagues walks into the office, and she tells him that her son has just been expelled from a community organization, and she is livid. And she's just going out like, the, the leaders of this organization are horrible, and look what they're doing to my son, and da-da-da, and, you know, and just went off and was complaining to him. And so he waited until, you know, three, five minutes passed, and she took a breath. And then he said, what result do you want to create? And she's like, I, can you believe what these people are doing? And blah, 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 and goes off into another tirade. And so he waits again, and then finally says, what result do you want to create? And she's like, I want to get my son back into this program, and da 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 da, and, and goes off again. And finally, the third time, he says, What result do you want to create? And then she stops. She says, What do you mean by that? 
And he says, with your son. You're raising a son. What result do you want to create? And she goes, well, I want him to grow up to be happy and responsible. Oh, all of this stuff I just said that I should do probably isn't going to help, is it? He's like, not if that's your purpose and the result that you want to create. And she's like, I need to actually let him suffer the consequences of this. And boom, laid out an entirely new plan. Now, that's, I illustrate that just as one of a zillion examples of personal you know, choices that you can make to move from problem solving to purpose finding and our instinctive reaction to being more ambitious about what we do. It turns out it goes everywhere. We won't have enough time to do this because I, I took too long in what we did. But <clears throat> if we had time, here's the exercise I would have liked to have done to kind of pull this in and make it personal at the end of our discussion. You remember how I said the two ways we typically get problems are number one, something goes wrong and we want it to get back to the way it was before. Or two, somebody just gives us a problem to work on and we don't think, well, but what result could I create here? So you could take out a pen and on a piece of paper write down what is something that's happened that I didn't like recently that I want to go back to the way it was and write out that problem. And then write down what's a problem that somebody gave me, my boss, my spouse, my kid, my you know, whoever else. What's a problem someone gave me? Write them down because writing it down helps us to think clearer about it, especially when we're practicing and developing the skills. And then for each one say, how could I turn this problem into a purpose? How could I turn this problem into a purpose? And if you really want to be ambitious about it, grab one of your partners at the table and give them your answers and ask for feedback, right? And then you can actually get some feedback on that and, and start practicing this on something that's real and relevant in your own life and see what impact it has. And uh, my experience is it's pretty significant most of the time. I had a student back bef in, uh, before I came here um, at my previous university who uh, was ne would never read his assignments in class. And, uh, you know, and I guess I should have put like, some grade in to make him read his assignments or something in that particular class. Uh, and so I'd run into him in the hallways in the uh, business school sometimes. And, and I'd be like, hey, how's it going? He's like, oh, it's great, Professor Quinn, you know, trying to hide or whatever it was. And then one day, he actually approached me and he said, I just read that book about uh, purpose finding, or not the book, the chapter from your book about purpose finding. I just completely redesigned this entire conference I was planning for my professor. And like the whole thing is different now and it's like way better, thanks. You know, I think we're gonna actually get more people to sign up and make more money and you know, the whole thing. And I was like, yeah, maybe you should read your book sometime. <laughs> um, but like the, the places it shows up and where it appears are, are, are pretty significant. So um, that's the question, right, is to ask yourself, if I want to practice the virtue of ambition, and to achieve that ideal sweet spot that Aristotle talked about, try asking yourself the question, what result do I want to create? All right, we're going to take a 10-minute break.